Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Why are stories of ancient gods filled with feuds, intrigues, and torrid love affairs? Were the gods extraterrestrials? And if they were, how could they interbreed with humans? Well, welcome to the 423rd edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Uh, I'm Paul, and Ben, I uh, have good news and bad news. He is uh, usually not with us uh, lately on Mondays because of his class schedule in Boston. But he is not at school today. Unfortunately, he is ill, so that's the bad news. And he still can't be with us, but he's with us in spirit and um, might try to call in later on. Anyway, those questions have to do with our guest, who we cannot reach on uh, the phone, unfortunately. She had confirmed with us, and we're going to try to get hold of her later. Uh, and uh, so, I, But I will introduce her, uh, being the eternal optimist, hoping we will get her. And then until we do, we will um, get, to the, get to some emails, our plan B. There are always plenty of those to go through. Anyway, this evening we welcome back, we hope, someone who has not been on the show for over three years. Uh, Dr. Rita Louise is a best-selling author, medical intuitive, broadcaster, founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics, and holds a Ph.D. in natural health counseling. She is the author of three books, as well as hundreds of articles that have been published worldwide. She has appeared on radio and television and has spoken at conferences covering topics such as health and healing, ghosts, intuition, and ancient mysteries. And it is that last item with which we planned uh, to concern ourselves this evening, particularly her book, Man-Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. So let's hope that we will get Rita uh, at some point this evening. Uh, hopefully there's no uh, no trouble. Uh, we are here in beautiful uh, northern Rhode Island, where we were under, or were, until the temperature went up, uh, two and a half or so feet of snow. I put some pictures on my Facebook page about that with my, Ben's older brother uh, while sort of shoveling yesterday, and it was quite an interesting <laughs> experience. Um, our friends in England, uh, we have a lot of relatives there, said that... Um, you know, two and a half inches, they, they close down, and through two and a half feet, they're, they find it inconceivable. So we're having lots of fun here in New England, and uh, we certainly hope everyone is uh, soon back uh, on the uh, the power grid, too. Anyway, here's a, a question from L- Lindsay. I doesn't want us to use her last We give people the option on our website form of using their last name or not, but this is Lindsay K. from Swickley, Pennsylvania. Uh, outside uh, Pittsburgh, probably listens to us on the great WISY on uh, CBS on Sunday nights. And her question has to do uh, with this. says, hello, I am really interested in what you have said about parasites masquerading as greys. I'll have to explain some of these terms. And that UFOs and ghosts can sometimes blend. Can you talk some more about this and give some examples from your cases? Well, I guess that could take up the whole show. Um, let me ad- identify some of the terms she's using. Uh, long-time listeners to our show are experts on this, but the word parasites in our use does not mean uh, has, has some, something from hell mythology, the study of parasitic worms. It is a study of sort of parasitic entities that I think are responsible, in my experience anyway, for our folklore about demons and evil spirits and things of that kind. They seem to be, in um, in my experience, life forms that, oddly enough, seem to move between parallel worlds as theorized in quantum mechanics. Uh, having sat in the paranormal trenches for well over 40 years, this is really the only theory that adequately explained things that, that I was running into, uh, along with colleagues over the years. And uh, people still have trouble accepting this because it's it's we tend to explain things in terms that we can understand, but our our own understanding is very limited, to say the least. We see things from our own point of view and our own framework, that of our five physical senses, and that just doesn't do it. I mean, the world is not what it appears to be, neither is anything in the paranormal, certainly. And these parasites are usually mistaken for evil dead people or servants of the devil or something like this, and they may even respond in that sort of way, but that's really not what they are. And I found out to my cost uh, that this is the case. As a matter of fact, a a very interesting case has arisen in Georgia. I really can't say much about it yet. I only uh, started dealing with it last night. Uh, Whether I will continue to deal with it is a question mark, but we'll talk about that a bit later. But anyway, that's what parasites are. 
are uh, they, they sort of are, are living things. I have had I don't believe they're spirits either because I have had physical confrontations with them on two occasions. Uh, quite a frightening experience, but there was perfect physicality there, uh, even though they, they were barely visible. Uh, not a, not another long story. But anyway, uh, parasites masquerading as greys. Greys are the most commonly reported aliens, assumed to be space aliens, people from other planets. And of course, you, if you've seen any of the films having to do with this, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, or any of these uh, communion, uh, about the story of Whitley Strieber, who was, has been a guest on the show, the, the other show, the Sunday night show. Uh, th- these are these are the most commonly reported aliens, and th- they are literally gray-skinned. Uh, sometimes feel, uh, some people report that they are almost semi-reptilian, and there are even theories that they have a lot to do with uh, with things on this planet. And uh, that's what grays are anyway. So uh, what um, Lindsay is asking here has to do with the parasites masquerading as grays. Uh, UFOs, of course, everybody knows what they are, and ghosts. Okay. We always say that things in the paranormal are very much connected, and this is one of the ways that in so, at some times and in some cases they do seem to be. Referring to my own cases here, uh, I can probably give you an example of this. There, uh, there have been several occasions when, when people have reported UFO activity and contact uh, having occurred between the uh, denizens of the supposed UFO and 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 uh, their own families and this kind of thing, but there was just something about it that really was extremely negative, as these contacts often are, and uh, it reminded me th- th- of of things that I've seen with parasitical entities. For example, uh, for our local audience in Burlville, Rhode Island, there were there was a, a really nasty case, probably the longest one we've ever worked on. It really has been going on since 1998. And fortunately, the people who are at the site now are very responsible about this and are very well aware of it. Uh, most of the family was there during the original case. And this involved parasitical entities that was that seemed to be attached to the land because of the electromagnetics involved and the geotechnics. And it's, again, it's kind of technical. But this thing uh, was the, the main one. There were two. Uh, was preying upon the woman of the family who was a very vulnerable person and was literally, and why do they do this? They do this to feed. This is how they feed. They seem to feed upon our energy. And uh, just on a hunch, I asked one of the neighbors and also the family, because you find that this is never limited to one one piece of property or one house or even one family. People in the area will very often, uh, almost always report when, when you can talk to them or when you have enough credibility for them to talk to you, will, will, will report phenomena of some kind as well. And several people reported UFOs having been seen on this property. So what on earth could this connection be? And sure enough, uh, there, is, there is the possibility that uh, there was a connection. In other cases, there has been a very clear connection between something that uh, pretended to be an alien, and these parasites very often will pretend to be something else. They really like seem, seem to like to push buttons because that makes you more upset or angry or fearful, and they feed on that. And again, this is a, this is not the usual approach you hear to ghost phenomena or things of this or demonic stuff, but that's what I've found. And perhaps Ben, ben and I, our voice is crying in the wilderness on this, but that, that's the way we see it. So what we're dealing with here could be something that's very slippery. Uh, there have been cases where people have seen the gray aliens, uh, you know, in, in some sort of abduction situation. Uh, in other words, they supposedly come into the person's bedroom at night and take them through walls and into spaceships and all this business. And I don't know, I, I always take that with kind of a pillar of salt. And uh, many cases I've seen that these things actually, when you see them for what they are, turn out to be parasites. And I'm not saying all these greys are, because I'm sure there are, is life on other planets, and I'm sure they, they, there might be ways to get here. Certain quantum, certainly quantum physics that we rely on in the paranormal allows for all kinds of strange travel like that. But nevertheless, it's, um, it's, it's a big question mark. So I think that you have to, ta- to have what is commonly known as discernment. You have to not think wishfully, and you must have common sense when something does not, and this is the biggest one of all, when something does not feel right, pay attention to that. Our, if you want to call it psychic ability or whatever you want to call it, the sixth sense or, or whatever, there are reasons why we have these instincts. If you go, go to a place, particularly if you're about to buy it, uh, and it doesn't feel right, don't 
not take that seriously. You, you really have to take it seriously. Um, we have those those feelings for reasons. If our remote ancestors had not had bad feelings about situations, uh, such as the uh, the predatory, uh, you know, the, the giant rhinoceros or predatory cat, you know, looking at them for lunch, because uh, well, rhinoceroses didn't eat people. Anyway, you get the point. That there were there were always uh, threats to our ancestors, and if they didn't have these sixth senses, if you want to call it that, they our species would not have survived. So pay attention to those things. So in any case. Uh, I, I think that uh, certainly Lindsay is onto something here. You ha- there are times when these things are blending, and the biggest lesson of all, I think, is don't trust what you meet in the paranormal, and especially don't go looking for it. Everybody is interested in ghost hunting, seemingly, and all this business—a term that I can't stand. And uh, I always say, if the paranormal comes to you and creates a problem, or even doesn't create a problem, that's one thing. But don't go looking for it because you have no idea what you're doing. Okay. So, uh, is that our guest by any chance? Yes. Oh, well, there we are. Stand by. Better late than never. Stand by, folks. We'll, Dr. Rita Louise. I hope. No. Yeah, all right. Well, in any case, uh, thank you, Lindsay, for, uh, for writing in. Uh, Dr. Rita Louise, are you with us? I'm with you now. Oh, that's good. Well, Sorry better, about that. Oh, better late than never. We have introduced you already, and we're very pleased that you could, uh, you could join us this evening. Uh, so welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. It's been about three years. I know. It's been forever. Well, it's time nice being back with you. Well, good. Well, time flies. We're having fun. Uh, okay. Well, let's uh, start our questions. Ben, unfortunately, is not here, as I explained. He's uh, under the weather this evening, and if he wasn't, he'd be in school in Boston, so it wouldn't do us any good. So it's just you and me tonight. Uh, Rita, the idea that ancient gods were really visitors from other planets is an old idea, but what is your particular viewpoint on that subject? Well, you know, there's, there was how we went into, I mean, because we wrote a book, Man Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, yeah. and that was our question, was, is there anything that supports that notion? I mean, you hear people talking about, well, myth says this, myth says this, but we really took a look at mythology, and we were, we were taken over to the dark side, Paul. Uh-huh. <laughs> because, you know, if it was just Greek myth or if it was just Sumerian myth that was basically telling stories about gods that the only way that has them make sense um, is that they were extraterrestrial. But we found a consistency in storylines around the globe that talked about characters that, in our opinion, were all, they were talking about the same individuals. The stories that are told... The names are changed. Some of the details are slightly different. But the storyline is remarkably consistent. Mm -hmm. And when you take all of these things together, the level of coincidence that you experience makes you have to conclude that there has to be something going on other than my imagination or your imagination or our ancestors' imagination. Hmm. All right. Uh, the, now, two weeks ago, our guest was Dr. Michael Heiser. He was a biblical scholar and expert on the ancient Near East, and we get into this stuff. Uh, he seemed surprised when I mentioned that I had counted in the Bible alone, never mind the other contemporary documents, at least 360 examples of objects or people ascending, descending, hovering, or just flying and sometimes at amazing speeds. Now, much as Ben and I like Mike personally, I thought his response was inadequate at best and maybe a little evasive. Essentially, he said that there were common Near Eastern themes that were in these things. So I asked him, and I'll ask you too, Rita, why is it always the sky gods? And, and, and Michael's response to that was because that's where people don't live. But I, I felt like saying it, we didn't have time. They don't, they don't live in the ocean either, unless you believe in mermaids. So, I mean, what, what, what say you on that? Well, actually, when you look at mythology, the gods live in three, depending on the culture, four different locations. There are the sky gods. Mm-hmm. There are the gods of fertility who actually they talk about their realm being under the water, so some kind of underground or underwater base. You have the gods of the underworld, like your Hermes, you know, who looks after the dead. And then, in, depending on the culture, they have this group that are the cyclopses, monsters, giants, and they live in the mountains and in the wooded areas of the planet. Well, there you go. When you read the Bible, 
there's only one God. You can't have a God in the underworld. You can't have a God in the ocean because there's only one. And they gave it to the sky God. One of the things that we discovered in these mythologies is that there was a great war that happened in antiquity. And I'm going to use the Greek uh, version of it. But basically, at one point in time, the god Kronos ruled over the earth. And he was usurped by his son, Zeus, who is a sky god. Kronos was actually a fertility god associated with the water. And um, they were the ones that won the battle. The sky gods won the battle. And we believe that's why they, they're they the ones in charge, because they're the ones that won the fight. Yeah. And so when we look to God, we look to heaven because they were the victors. Now, it's funny, just before you, you called, we uh, fell back on Plan B, which is always our ever-growing stack of emails. We can never keep up. We do whole shows that we can't keep up. But this is a question from uh, a, a listener in, in uh, Sewickley, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, who was asking about more about what cases we've run into that have to do with uh, greys, uh, supposed alien greys, but they actually turn out to be parasitical entities or vice versa. And uh, I was talking a bit about that. And one of the points that I made, and I'd like to get your comment on this, is that people will see these things and encounter these things. And part of the human experience has to do with things seen in the sky and all these gods and with parasitical entities. And we don't really understand quantum physics, I suppose, or at least uh, our, our, our ancestors didn't, except the most remote ones, seemingly. And what we come up with is stories of these various gods and doing this and doing the other thing. And, uh, I mean, I, and it's somehow real experiences translated into folklore in ways that we can understand it. I mean, is that something you would agree with? Um, yes, I, t- I definitely agree with that uh, concept. One of the things that we did glean, and, and you'll appreciate this, one of the things that we did glean from the mythology was that our ancestors understood what ghosts are, you know, so they understood what a non-corporeal being was, you know, they tell ghost stories, you know, and so there's a clear consciousness of what an interdimensional being might be, because I consider a ghost an interdimensional being. As do Um, I. But that, and, and that's not what they're talking about. Yeah. However, if you talk to the Aborigines in Australia or the Cree in Quebec, as I have and many others have, they they, they have a concept of interdimensional beings. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, two of them told me that they that they knew shamans when they were kids who went in and actually grabbed people who had died here and pulled them back bodily from where they hadn't died. Big mistake, but it worked. Uh, so anyway, they they had a concept of that. But what's um. Really, kind of uh, extremely strange, I thought, is uh, there that in the Bible, and most people are familiar with the Bible as opposed to the Mahabharata or the Atrahasis or the Karsag epic. So I'll use the Bible as an example. There, there is the notion of the divine council, which I was found very intriguing. Psalm eighty-five, I believe, I found it very intriguing. That unless it's a complete poetic thing, but th- th- there's always something behind <laughs> these things, where God. Stands the, the God of, the, of Hebrew Yahweh stands up in the midst of the gods, and it says that it says it in Hebrew too. And uh, people say, "Well, gee, well, who are these gods? And you know, are there other gods and all this?" So there was some concept of the um, a, a sort of a council of whoever these beings were. Who do you who do you say they were? Well, I mean, there in multiple cultures, they talk about you know the the. I like to call them, you know, kind of like the CEO and the department head, you know. So there is the supreme god and then his chief guys. You know, in the Bible, again, I go back to, you know, they had a big can of whiteout, and they got rid of all the other guys, gods, except in a few spots they missed. Mm -hmm. You know, and and these little references kind of snuck through that we today are looking at in a very different way than they were looked at 200 years ago, 500 years ago. Yeah, that, that seems ago. to be the case, absolutely. Um, so if these visitors or intruders were really from somewhere else, do you have any idea who they were, where they came from? Well, what we found in mythology are consistent references to four different star groups. 
Um, one of them being the Pleiades. Uh, a second one being the North Star, you know, part of the Big Dipper. The Polaris, um, a, yeah. Th- a third one being uh, Cirrus. And a fourth one being Orion, the Orion Star Group. Mm. You know, the only one that is actually, there's any direct claim, it comes from the Dogon, who are a tribe in Africa who say that um, their ancestors came to this world in an ark from Cirrus, um, and they look like half man, half fish. I mean, that's, hmm. that's their story, and they're sticking to it. Yeah. Oh, no, you're absolutely correct. There's there's lots of independent corroboration on that. As a matter of fact, uh, am I wrong, or did they point out stars in that group that had not yet been discovered? They did. I mean, they talked about, uh, I think it's Cirrus B. I don't know. There's three stars. As yeah, I don't quite remember either. Cirrus yeah. cl- cluster. Right. And two of them we knew about, and and then one of them they didn't know about because it was so small. And it only was discovered in the 70s, something like that. I believe that's correct, yeah. And um, Thanks to Hubble or something. Correct, yeah. correct. And then uh, Carl Sagan turned around and said, well, they only knew about it because, you know, they heard about it on the news or whatever. <laughs> and, and they incorporated it into their mythology. Yeah. However, they had been celebrating a, a holiday, a celebration once every I'm going to say 52 years, I I forget the exact number, that reflects the rotation of this star, you know, in Cirrus, you know, exactly. Yeah, no, that's true. How could they they know about it if they just heard about it, you know? Exactly. You know, it's funny. It's funny that you mention Orion's belt. We, we, We seem to be drawn to Orion. Of course, you know, it is admittedly probably the the easiest group of stars to see in the sky they, they tend to be kind of bright and they stand out even under a certain amount of city lights but that's the first constellation i learned my father pointed out to me in the sky when i was like five and uh, orion and particularly orion's belt those three stars but but we th- there's all sorts of speculation that a number of structures on the planet including the pyramids at giza and all this thing are laid out to reflect orion now you could say i, I sometimes think this is stretched a bit you you could say for example the washington monument is what 555 and one fifth you know feet and how so many five inches or something which is uh exactly what one billionth of distance to somewhere you know you could say that with anything however there do seem to be an awful lot of odd correlations like the third star is just a little bit uh askew in these terrestrial lineups of buildings and ancient stuff and all that uh are, are we reading too much into that or you think that's there's something to that I mean, I think that that is a possibility, that that's what... I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that they say <laughs> oh, <laughs> that yeah, I would yeah. throw into that pile. You know, but I think that that's a possibility. Yeah, well, that, anything is that possible. There's truth to that. Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. It doesn't make my BS meter go... Burr, burr, burr. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's kind of like... So I just keep that in the back of my mind, you know. But in Egypt, in particular, that's really where we see a lot of the conversation about Orion and Orion's belt mm. coming up through mythology. So it does seem congruent. Okay. In your reading of mythology, do there seem to be different... Because in my, in my reading, I would, there are different groups of whoever these people were, sometimes who fought each other. Uh, what's your reading on that? Well, I mean, when you read mythology, it gets a little bit confusing because in many of the cultures, not all, but many of the cultures, they identify a lineage. So kind of going back to the Greek, there's Uranus, who is a progenitor god, who we believe were him and seven other individuals, which is a very consistent number, came in the cosmic egg to this earth. And... Um, then there was another group. In Greek mythology, it says it was his children. In other mythology, it says that the progenitors created a race of giants, a.k.a. the Titans. So whether they were a created race, whether they were actually the offspring, hard to tell. Yeah. You know, and, then, and then Kronos is usurped by Zeus. Zeus is supposedly Kronos' child. My my gut feeling is my gut feeling is is that they were actually a different group. Hmm. 
you know, of extraterrestrials or some rivaling group that were all here on the Earth. Because when you look at the descriptions of the gods, they don't look like each other. No, you know, we have no. these half man, half fish. We have ones that we will assume, you know, we were created in God's image. Um, well, Aristotle must be a rather strange-looking fellow. Yeah. You know, which would be more like the Nordics. But there are ones that have, you know, fangs and the giants and the cyclopses. And, I mean, they have all kinds of weird descriptions that are not human. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Uh, we are scheduled for a break right now, and uh, I will just say, uh, anyway, we are... <laughs> You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno, without the Ben this evening, unfortunately, on WON 1240 AM in New England's beautiful but snowbound Blackstone River Valley. And we will be right back. Or are we going anywhere? We don't have to. Oh. That's all right. Uh, uh, is she got a problem on the phone here? Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to take the 630 oh, break. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. We'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Producer. Be right back. Hi, I'm Russ Gorman. If you're concerned about 2013, relax. It's actually the 14th year of the 21st century, and a great time to get an astrological chart done. This year, I'm offering an added feature. I'm including lucky numbers on request with each chart or update at no extra fee. Discover what tomorrow will bring in regard to money, health, job, relationships, or possible windfalls. Call me at 401-333-4048 for information on getting your individual chart or update. Give your life a fresh start. Welcome the changes the planets are providing. I'm also available for private parties and speaking engagements for groups. Look forward to enjoying your future this year. Call me, Russ Gorman, at 401-333-4048. Terrestrial aliens and ancient aliens, things of that kind, and uh, there are little innuendos to this you might not catch on the History Channel, which at this point seems to be the Alien Channel. Anyway, Rita, in my uh, last book, Turning Home, I pointed out that the human genome has 223 genes that shouldn't be there, at least if our current knowledge of, of, of evolution is correct. Could these visitors have messed with our genetics, as many people believe? Well, when you look at, you know, and I keep going back to mythology because that's really what our book was about, and mm. that's where I can speak from confidence, you know, versus speculation, secondhand knowledge. There are multiple, multiple myths that you find around the world that says that the gods created us. And when you read these stories, you're pretty hard-pressed to not think that there is some kind of genetic engineering going on. For example, in uh, Mesoamerica, they talk about that they um, actually created man multiple times. The first time they made man out of mud, but when it rained, he melted. And the next time they made him out of sticks, but he was stupid and he didn't have any feelings, and so they got rid of that one. Are there three and little pigs the- involved in this? <laughs> you know, and then they finally decided to try making one out of corn, and they made one out of white, yellow, red, and black, and they were great, and that was where mankind came from. Hmm. In Sumeria, they have a very similar line of mythology. They made one, and it couldn't stand up. They made another one, and it couldn't hold its urine. They made another one, and it was a female, but she couldn't reproduce. Mm-hmm. You know, And so they go through like seven different iterations until they came up with a form of mankind that satisfied all their requirements. We don't really know what their requirements were, but their requirements. You know, and when we look at the archaeological record, you know, we don't have the missing link. You know, we don't have, you know, the laboratory that they created them in. But there are so many, and I'm going to say coincidences, that occur within the last two million years that you become really hard-pressed to say there wasn't something more than evolution at work. Well, you know, I tend to agree, and I think you're referring to the the Karsag epics of the Sumerians talking about that. Now, 
But now, now, now here's the here's the gist of the problem, as far as as I can see it, uh, with with alien genetics. Uh, the Bible talks about these quote sons of the Most High intermarrying with human women and producing these um, nephilim or giants, heroes of old quote unquote. Uh, the Atra Hasis, the creation story of the ancient Akkadian Empire literally describes test tube genetic engineering using blood and saliva from one of the visitors to apparently re-engineer the natives, us, uh, to do any of those things. The visitor DNA would have had to been virtually identical to ours. That's why I espouse the idea that these weren't aliens, but travelers, uh, a term Ben and I got from, you might say, the horse's mouth, uh, humans who dropped in, blundered in, or were sucked in from an alternate world in the multiverse. Uh, what say you? I, I'm not. I'm not leaning that way. Um, there are stories. I mean, one of the things that seemed very clear in mythology is that they really weren't able to survive on the surface of the planet, hmm. and so they created a race. This is the conclusion we came to. They created a race that was actually able to live on the surface, and when they went to create mankind with the blood, the saliva, that whole thing, you know, in, in one story they had. Um, they wanted to create a race of mankind, and so they were told to go into the underworld and get the bone of one of the giants who had been in the previous race and bring it back out. And so I think that they took something that was already based on Earth, you know, that was acclimated to this planet, and then kind of did a, a revamping. Do you feel that we that. we are acclimated to this planet? A lot of people write in and say they... they uh... There are funny things about, you know, not just the missing genes, or rather the, the extra genes, but there are funny things about humans. For example, every other indigenous creature to this planet has um, the, the proper fur or, you know, something that doesn't require them to go out and work eight hours a day and slave over, over a hot, you know, field growing their own stuff. You know, is it... Um, I'm not saying I believe that, but I mean, is is that uh, what the people who are expressing that opinion? What what's your opinion of their opinion? Okay, well, I mean, there are a lot of people that ascribe to Zachariah Sitchin's material that says that we were created as a slave species, you know, and that does come up in mythology. Okay, that does <clears throat> not slave species, but we were created because of the outcome of a war that happened. Anyway, with that said. Um, I like to use the word domesticated. We are the ideal domesticated species on this planet. And our behavior emulates the gods. The gods lived in cities. I don't believe the gods had a lot of hair on their body, if any hair on their body. You know, and I think that was part of our genetic inheritance from them was to <clears throat> lose the hair. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Uh, you know, I, I it just we, we obviously don't know this for sure, but there are tantalizing clues, as you say, certainly in folklore. Uh, what happened to these visitors? As you say, they weren't suited to life here, but if, if your theory is correct, I mean, what happened to them? They well, die, I mean, leave, what? I think that, to a certain extent, that they are still here. In what way? Well, I mean, if you think about modern ufology... Oh, if, right. if you think of modern ufology, where do we find the stories happening from? We have these gods that are flying around in the sky, you know, with the mothership, okay? And I'm not a, a ufologist. I would not give myself that title. Um, you know, we have these stories that talk about underground bases, which is where creation supposedly took place. And then we have these stories about the USOs, about these, these craft coming out from under the water. Mm-hmm. Well, we have stories in mythology that talk about, you know, where they would take their fly, their fiery chariots and go into the water back to their domain, you know. And so it's what we're seeing and the stories that come out of modern mythology or modern ufology really match what we see in antiquity. You know, they're just not interacting with us. Yeah. I, I, that's undeniable. It really seems to be the case. Uh, it, no matter how you, you turn it and look at it, um, reading Genesis in Hebrew is, is a frightening experience depending on how you read it because it, it talks about an agricultural colony, uh, well, even to Eden as we call it, but in Jordan, as I'm sure you know, there is Echden. It's a small town now, but the, the traditions in the area are that, um, 
gods lived on the surrounding mountaintops and uh, descended into the valley, and there was a, like there was a evidence of, a, of an unbelievably ancient agricultural colony of some kind, uh, and uh, that's, I don't know, it just really kind of fits with the story. Now, whether that actually is the case, I don't know, but that's what kind of made me uh, um, perk up and, and take notice of that, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and I was going to ask, it's funny you mentioned the, the presence of current ufology, and if, if this is what it appears to be, what would be the connection with alien abductions? As we now, now neither of us is a ufologist, as you say, but well, this is so not in the book, and this is actually we're working on a new book to really look at the concept of some of the anomalies, like the underground bases. I don't know, I have this thing about the underground bases but i'll tell you what you start looking into that oh my god it gets just so totally weird yeah um, <laughs> so weird. i've talked to people who supposedly have had experiences at the remnants of these bases you know who knows yeah but it you know it, it just is weird i'm not saying it's not true you know i haven't got i have not researched and got enough evidence to make a determination, my own, and I don't want to go to one. So no, of, of course. I don't want to go to one. No, I respect uh. that. It's better to, to <laughs> say what you know. Uh, but, and at this point, Rita, we'd like to, before, because this hour is going so fast because it's such a fascinating conversation, but tell us about your book, uh, Man Made, and any of the other books you want, and your website, and just uh, where people can get it and that sort of thing before we, before we burn up the hour and you don't have a chance. Okay. Okay, so this book is called Man Made, the Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. It's available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. If you talk really nice to your local retailer, especially Barnes & Noble, they probably will, will be able to order you a copy. Mm -hmm. um, it's also available on my website, which is SoulHealer.com, S-O-U-L-H-E-A-L-E-R.com, SoulHealer.com. You buy anything from us, it always comes autographed. Oh, how nice. We and have a can connection. I make one other quick announcement yep. to your listeners. So in June of this year, uh, Brian Forrester, who has been on Ancient Aliens multiple times, he and I are teaming up together, and we're doing what we're calling the Science and Spirituality Tour. And we're going down to Peru to a bunch of the ancient sites in the Cusco area. And one of the things that we're doing that no one else has done is we're going to be incorporating remote viewing techniques we're going to be incorporating other intuitive techniques with the sole purpose of trying to communicate with the ancestors, use it to help identify why the structures were built, how the structures were built. It is all being done cold, blind, like you're going in and doing a ghost hunting investigation, except on an ancient site. Hmm. It's going to be so cool. We kind of did that at Rendlesham Forest on <laughs> And since did. in September, yeah, Ben and I were over there. Uh, very interesting. We, we've done a lot of shows on that. Uh, it's all available on our podcast page on BehindTheParanormal.com. But uh, we have a link uh, to uh, your site, uh, certainly SoulHealer.com, at uh, at our site uh, in several places. And we, we urge people to take a look. Rita's a, a great person. We've never met, but we've, we've known each other for a while now. And uh, always a great guest. Uh, okay, so let's continue uh, with some of the genetics here. There is... A dark side to this, as you know, and in our work, it comes up in the form of, well, a question that, that uh, our friend from Pennsylvania wrote in before you, we, we uh, connected with you today, Rita, and that was uh, the, the things not being what they appear to be. There is some evidence, and I, it's very distasteful to even say it, but that, that we might have been, even if we weren't bred for it, became almost cattle for these parasitical entities that sometimes will appear to be greys and all this stuff that, that, that do abductions. And because we've run into cases, not always, but sometimes where things are what uh, appear to be one thing, perhaps alien visitation, and turn out to be something hungry and hostile instead. Do you feel that these alien visitors, either in the ancient world or, their, or today, are good for us or bad for us or neutral or what? Oh, pretty loaded question. That's why I asked it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're good that way. Thank you. Um, like I said, I've started researching this uh, underground base thing, and they, it is so negative and so awful that it is really hard for me to wrap my mind around. 
Mm-hmm. However, however, when you read the mythology that comes down to us, you know, our belief is that, you know, there is a kind, loving God up there looking out for us. But when you read the stories, that's anything but what you find. And so if their whole agenda, this is kind of, this just came to me and I'll share it with your people. If their whole agenda is about power and control, the more power we have, the more control we have over ourselves, the more they're going to be fighting for it and vying for it. That's well put. That's true. You know, the, despite all the evidence you acquire, you know, you find and all the negative stuff you run into, I must believe that beyond it all, there is a good and loving God, he, she, it, or them, you know. And uh, one of the problems with, with saying, aha, these aliens created us, is that, well, who created them? And the evidence uh, apparently, is, as I can see it, is not that they created us, but that they changed us, which is not the same thing. What say you? No, I think if you go far enough back down the the, the tree, I mean, one of the things that we discussed in the book was that we have the belief that the progenitor gods came here and actually terraformed the planet. And so they were in, in seminal, is that the right word? Yeah. Uh, in the whole development of the planet and the, of the development of life on Earth. So whether they helped to give fish eyeballs or whether they made us be conscious, you know, they were always, it just seems like they've always been in the background here on Earth. Yeah, that's, that's hard to, to deny. Um, the, the idea, though, I, I don't want to keep bringing up the wars, but that seems to be a problem in the Mahabharata, for example. And there seem to be references in the Atrahasis and the Kasag epics, not so much in the Bible, maybe, of these gods literally founding, because actually the most ancient cities we know about were named after their patron gods. The gods who supposedly founded the cities, as, as you mentioned, uh, in, in so many words. And there, there's evidence uh, in the documents of the gods, you know, sort of uh, jaunting off in their flying machines to visit each other at time to time to hobnob with, uh, with each other. But then there seemed to be a problem uh, with... Uh, you know, the gods actually leading people in battle, and the Mahabharata, have, of course, as you know, is the poem of India, has uh, flying machines. Uh, today, even in in uh, several in Hindi and several other languages, a, a vimana is what they refer to uh, airplanes and jets as. And uh, it just seems to me that there might have been some serious battles going on. Uh, in my book, I mentioned that we have. Um, uh, Mohenjo Daro, for example, in Pakistan, which is in the Indus Valley, uh, ancient, ancient civilization. And there's evidence that the central part of the city was literally melted. And, uh, he, the, the, the greenish glass, sort of, you see it at the, the ground, there's nuclear explosions. A friend of mine was there, uh, was present at the, the measuring of a number of skeletons there. The, 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 uh, radioactivity on them was unbelievable. And, uh, it just seems to be there was a real dark side to this as far as uh, wars were concerned, in which we were the pawns. So, do you see that at all? But where we actually come into the storyline is very late. Hmm. You know, I haven't... One of the things that has been very confusing to me... Okay, so like the, the Ramayana, which I have read the entire thing, um, is definitely placed pre-flood based on the narrative that's in that book. And when they talk about the different Rama and Sita and his brother and all of these people, my impression is that they're not human in the way we see humanity. Yeah, it's funny they're depicted as blue in Hindu art. But it was this earlier race of beings. When we get to the Mahabharata, either they were just pre-flood or post-flood. You know, and so, because one of the problems that we have in Indian culture, and we we experience little weird idiosyncrasies all over, is that they tell the story of Manu the fish as their flood story. But that story is actually the story of their very first avatar, which says that that guy existed at the beginning of this last kulpa. And so it kind of throws off the timeline. You know, one of the things that we did find was that in mythology, they tell of 
two floods, not just one. And so the NOAA flood is actually the second more current flood versus an earlier flood, which is more tied to this Manu and the fish. Mm -hmm. And so when we get Mm -hmm. into Indian cosmology, there's not really a Noah's flood-like story, but the Manu and the fish actually fits into that slot when you read the storyline. So it's confusing in that way. Because other cultures, when they talk about this first flood, what they talk about is that there is a big war, and at the conclusion of this war, that uh, with the with the body of one of the gods, um, they create the planet, they create the mountains and the trees, and the, their teeth became the hillsides, and their hair became the, the grass, and their blood became the rivers and oceans. And then right after that, the normal line will say something to the effect, and then the gods put the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. Hmm. Okay, and no, that I, I, I recognize that from, yeah, you, you, that's true, that's true, yeah. But even if you read the Bible, the third day, you know, people go, oh, it's a mistake, but it's a very consistent mythological line. The third day, God creates the plants. On the fourth day, he puts the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky. Mm-hmm. Now, you think normally, well, how can you have plants? No photosynthesis, no sun. It won't work. But we find that same chronology in myth around the world. So terrible. Very interesting. It's That's extremely what our interesting. Thought was. Yeah. That was our thought was. Uh huh. Oh, very interesting. Wow. Now, as far, uh, I wish we could have time to talk more about that particular aspect of it, but as far as them, uh, do you believe in ancestral memory? Uh, I'll say yes. Pregnant pause. <laughs> okay. And the reason I ask is because if they messed with our genetics and made us somewhat what we are, then th- there may be interesting reasons why people will sometimes come to us and say, you know, I'm perfectly sane. Uh, I've never been treated for psychiatric illness, never had anything, I'm not on drugs, I mean, but I don't feel as if I belong here. I don't feel a part of this species, and they often will come to us because they, they like our multiverse view of life, you know, that, that you are, we are each other, literally, and all this business. And But they said sometimes it even goes beyond that to just feeling they don't belong here at all. I mean, would mm-hmm. that, could that possibly be a result of this genetic mixing or, or manipulation at some point? Well, I mean, I mean, you know that I work as an intuitive, and I've had sure. a number of clients that come to, have come to me with, you know, that's not their main complaint, but it will come up. Mm. And when I've looked at their energy, the impression that I have gotten was that the earth was not their originating home and that they maybe have incarnated on the earth one time before, Sometimes this is their first incarnation on this planet, and so they're just not used to being human, and they would rather go back to what is familiar to them. Okay. Uh, well, our point of view on it, on that is, you know, we believe in simultaneity and you know parallel lives rather than past lives. As you know, we've talked about all this, but mm-hmm. um, I suppose in a way, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Do you feel that these? visitors will come, you, you, that they never left or that they will come back or that they, you know, or what? Well, one of the things that it seems very evident in mythology is that when the gods were interacting with humanity, they weren't hanging out in our kitchens or anything. You know, they, they would come, they would visit. Uh, Barosis, a Babylonian priest, identified that the uh, Onas, the half man, half fish that came out of the water, aka waters associated with the fertility god and the god of creation, uh, came and taught mankind arc, uh, agriculture. He taught mankind different things, use of fire, and our history. But he, the, the first time that he came was like 300 and something thousand BC, and he came six times. And so the last, and I'm going to say, in our opinion, download that we've received from these gods was somewhere, and I'm just kind of throwing out a real broad number, about 3500 B.C. 
very broad number. Yeah, we, we just don't. I mean, this could be in, in the six figures as far as years ago. Nobody really knows. Well, but when we see these blips in development, you know, there was a blip uh, 30,000 years ago. Then there was another one about 10,000 years ago. Then there was another one in this 5,000 to 3,500 year ago. You know what I mean? So we see these blips. The last blip was about 3,500 years ago. There are some people in the UFO community that say that our spurt in technology was actually driven by the extraterrestrials. You know, they they didn't teach us, but they left their crafts around so we could back engineer them, which, you know, whatever. But if you think in terms of these gods, you know, it hasn't even been 5,000 years or just barely five. And they have last made their appearance, and in their lives, it is just, you know, a blink of an eye. Well, you know, that's true. Another thing, and we're almost out of time, but I wanted to just ask you, were there several, or could there have been, it seems to me that there could have been, several unrelated, as much as anything can be unrelated, unrelated incidents of intrusion in our history, I mean, we we, we got a, a, at least a million years of human existence is unaccounted for, empty, and uh, you know a thousand civilizations could have risen and fallen, and all this. Could there have been several intrusions of this kind that contributed to our folklore on this? You mean in the history of mankind? In, in the history, history of, of yeah. The planet? In the history, well, that's a good question. Now, let's just say in the history of the human race. I mean, in the history of the human race, you know, there have been multiple uh, periods. You know, that's where I was talking about those beliefs, you know, yeah. starting at 40,000 years ago. But it really started about 3 million years ago mm-hmm. where we were uh, Australopithecus, you know, and we were just barely walking upright. Whether walking upright was part of a intervention by the extraterrestrials, I don't know. But even scientists are hard-pressed to say how in two million years we could go from just barely walking upright, and we're talking just barely, to being able to use tools, to being hairless, to having the rudiments of culture, to being able to speak, because prior to that we did not have the vocalization, you know, the the, uh, body parts in order to speak in the way we do. to be able to use fire. I mean, there were all of these things that happened in less than two million years that they can't explain. Well, as a watcher of Rhode Island politics, I can assure you the Australopithecines haven't gone anywhere, or else they all came <laughs> here. Anyway, uh, that's not relevant to the show. But, uh, okay, well, I, I, we're just about ready to wrap up. I'll give you the last word, uh, Rita. What, um, wh- how, how do we deal with this? How do we approach it? What, uh, what, what can it do for us in a positive way, a knowledge of this? Well, I think for every for people, you know, we have been so brainwashed by what the Bible says. If you look at a culture outside of Western civilization, there is a longstanding history and belief in the sky people or these gods that live underground. And, you know, one of the things that we hope people do is to at least ask the question, is that true? Right, that's it. And also, to, uh, to if you can, learn Hebrew and Greek and read it in the original. Um, <laughs> well, one problem I see, with, with uh, unfortunately, with, with all scriptures is that it's passed down, you know, handwritten mistakes. Um, it's, you know, one likes to think that somehow the Spirit has preserved the proper uh, feel there and the, and the proper thing, but it's there are all sorts of problems with ancient manuscripts in general. So in any case, uh, that's a, that's for a different time. But uh, Dr. Rita Louise, thank you so much for being with us. It's it was a, it's always such a pleasant conversation, and um, we will have you back again soon. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Until then, I said hi. I will. Uh, he'll be feeling better, I'm sure, next time. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Very good. Dr. Rita Louise, the book, Man-Made Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. Check it out. Okay. We are uh, just about wrapping up here. And I wanted to mention, of course, you can can email us. Uh, We have an open line show coming up in two weeks. You can email us at paul at behindtheparanormal.com or ben at behindtheparanormal.com. 
You can write us a good old fashioned letter as well, uh, care of behind the paranormal television, uh, behind the paranormal radio, uh, care of WON 1240 AM, 985 Park Avenue in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. I defy you furnace to spell that. It's not so difficult. 02895. You can also contact us through our website, BehindTheParanormal.com, where you can find lots of information on guests, on uh, past, present, and future guests, uh, information on what Ben and I are doing, and also 450, uh, almost 450 free podcasts of our shows from the CBS uh, Radio Network and from WON here in uh, Rhode Island. You can also buy my book, subscribe to our newsletter, do lots of great stuff. Okay, so uh, where's the rest of my script? Aha, okay. Many thanks to our uh, talented and personable producer, Steve Bianchi. And uh, next week, February 18th, we will talk about paranormal lives of the saints. And some of that might surprise you. As part of that, we will also talk about one socket's own Marie Rose Farron. So you local folks especially might want to call in or drop us an email on, on that. And on our CBS Radio Edition, February 17th, Ben and I will talk with our good friend Murray Silver about the especially unusual subject, Ghosts and Disease. And we leave you this evening with a thought from the British writer Sir, Oswell, uh, Sir Osbert Sitwell. Killing time is only the name for another of the multifarious ways by which time kills us. Thanks for sailing with us on our great cosmic journey, and we'll see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.